This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. When a prominent San Francisco woman committed suicide recently, her photograph and the story of her death appeared on page one of the newspapers. But had she been the wife of a manual laborer or a small shop owner, there might have been no more than a two-inch item on page 26. In her case, it was front page news. And why? Because the public always finds it incredible, unbelievable, that anyone with power, prominence, and wealth would be dissatisfied with life. But one Jesus of Nazareth knew better. What shall it profit a man, he asked, to gain the whole world, but to lose his own soul? Without a growing spiritual life, human beings are restless and dissatisfied. Some people are uninterested in religion and philosophy because their adequacy has never been tested. They've contented themselves with paltry aspirations and meager goals. Never have they known the thrill of great endeavor, the stirring straining with all their strength to achieve some noble aim, the vital adventure of living by supreme ideals and seeking perfection even as God is perfect. Only he who hungers knows the true delight of food, and no one savors water as the man whose tongue smolders with thirst. The lumberjack who swings an axe and drives a saw all day knows more about the joy of falling asleep at night than the shiftless lad who lies around his room in indolence. It is a physiological fact. He who does little work needs little food. Likewise, he who dreams no dreams, has no hopes, loves, aspirations, mighty tasks, and projects in his life may feel but little need of further spiritual growth and the power of God. A baby's bathtub boat has no need of mighty canvas sails stretched into the winds. It isn't going anywhere. So it is with the person who toys with the trivialities of life. He never dares give himself wholeheartedly to the best he knows. Never having spent his own strength, he feels perhaps no need for the strength of God. But the man or woman who seeks to live as the master taught, as a son or daughter of God, as a brother or sister to every other person he or she encounters, the person who really tries to love his enemies, bless those who curse him, pray for those who despise him, return good for evil, live by the noblest truth he or she knows, that person soon discovers his own inward inadequacy, spiritual shortcomings. He finds he can't live this higher life by his own power alone, but needs the inner energies of God. And turning to God with all of his heart, he discovers God as a person and a power in life and begins the adventure of spiritual growth. The late historian Arnold Toynbee wrote, People are now afraid of being alone with themselves. They turn on the radio or the TV or phonograph at once. They can't dare to be alone with their own thoughts and feelings. This is the ultimate cowardice. Jesus knew the sustaining strength of solitude. Often he went apart to pray, worship, and seek spiritual energy for daily living. He further taught that every person was created for this same kind of close companionship with God. You were born to live in joy as a son or daughter of the Universal Father as a brother or sister to all of humankind in the worldwide family of God. This vital fellowship with your Father is yours by faith alone. Persist in your faith and your prayer and your seeking of God's will. Develop unwavering spiritual perseverance. Jesus spent hours in prayer and worship. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his arrest, he prayed for the will of God not once, but three times in a row. He prayed with perseverance. Once your life is given then to God, a new spirit of spiritual growth will take place in your soul. But even at that, you may feel you're progressing too slowly. But be patient. When you plant a flower in a pot, will tugging and pulling at it make it grow any more readily? Neither will worry and fretting accelerate spiritual progress. The flower grows no faster because the gardener worries. It only needs the proper conditions of growth, sunlight, soil, and water. Neither can anxiety create spiritual progress in your life. You need only persevere in prayer, worship, faith, and the love of God and people. Maximum spiritual growth will be the inevitable result, and your life will excitingly begin to change. In the year 1912, when the Titanic sank, among the 1,513 people who drowned at sea was a prominent Philadelphia millionaire. He and his valet came strolling onto the deck amid the panicked passengers, both impeccably attired in their tuxedos. We have dressed in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen, he declared. Yet, noble as it may be, to die at one's best. Far more important is living at one's best. Truly great men and women are those who live by truly great ideals and ideas. They're never contented with petty purposes. Jesus of Nazareth challenged people to be true to the best you know. He didn't say, be you therefore genteel, even as... The Pharisees in the temple are genteel. He called people to the ultimate goal. 
He said, Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. A tremendous difference. Real spiritual growth is becoming godlike. But spiritual growth is not instantaneous. It can't be. Jesus compared it to the planting of a mustard seed, the leavening of yeast in the pan of bread dough, the ripening of crops in the field. Luke writes that Jesus himself increased or grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. His own spiritual growth took time. So will yours. The best way for a colt to become a horse is to enjoy being a colt by prancing and frisking in the pasture. It naturally increases in strength, stamina, stature. So it is with you. Refuse to worry and despair over your spiritual growth. Worry and despair are, in fact, enemies of spiritual growth. Resolve joyfully to delight in the progress you've made instead of mourning over the progress you haven't made. Maintain a childlike, trusting faith in God. Seek, said Jesus, and you will find. Ask, and you will receive. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Growth comes in this questing. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, said Jesus, for they shall be filled. The master emphasized that people must positively and aggressively search for truth. He didn't say wish and you will find and whine and you'll receive or daydream and the doors will be opened. You have to turn to God with all your heart and dedicate your life, your energies to the Father in utter faith. You'll never find wholehearted spiritual joy in half-hearted spiritual commitment. Have faith. As a son or daughter of the living God, you possess unsuspected spiritual possibilities. Astronomers have found that with our naked eyes, you and I can see only about 9,000 stars in the sky at most. But by means of cameras and telescopes, scientists count hundreds of thousands of stars beyond. So it is with life itself. There is far more to existence than meets the eye at first glance. There is a spiritual dimension as well. Far from being a coldly mechanical, merely material universe, this cosmos is the starry household of the family of God, and you are a valuable member in it. God the Father personally cares about you, and by seeking God's will and wisdom for your life, you can discover the enthralling adventure of spiritual growth day by day and for all eternity beyond. There was a little girl one time, been in bed several days, recovering from the flu. Then one afternoon, her grandmother came to visit her, and she said, My child, how did you find yourself this morning? The little girl replied, It was easy. I opened my eyes, and there I was. Believe it or not, it is precisely that easy to find God. Just open your eyes, and there he is. In Genesis, it is written, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. The hour is striking for all of humankind to awaken from their spiritual slumberings and realize surely God is in this place and we knew it not. Men and women live and die seeking for the very God whose spirit indwells the mortal mind. God is where you are. God's spirit is inside you. God is not a hair's breadth from your thoughts this moment. Think of it. God's presence patrols the starry circuits of space and spans the leagues of infinity, yet watches and waits within the mind of man as well. Ponder the solemn fact that human beings are more than we think we are. We are spiritual children of God, kin to the creator of the cosmos. Suppose a dull-witted fellow taking a scenic bus tour through the Rockies began complaining to the driver that the mountains were blocking his view. One might smile at that. The mountains are the view. Yet many a man or woman will spend an entire lifetime thinking anguished and despairing thoughts about how he or she is unable to find God, about how God is so far, far away. Yet will fail to recognize that the very mind which he's using to think these despairing thoughts is the very place where God dwells. It's like putting on your glasses to look for your glasses. They're not lost, you're wearing them. So God is not lost. God inhabits the tabernacle of the human mind. Jesus proclaims this stirring truth in Luke 17, 21. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Or as scholar J.B. Phillips translates it, the kingdom of God never comes by watching for it. Men cannot say, look, here it is or there it is, for the kingdom of God is inside you. In Nehemiah, it is written that God gives his good spirit to instruct us. In Job, we read, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. In Proverbs, we read, the spirit in man is the candle of God searching all the inward parts. God's spirit, a fragment of infinity, indwells your mind. You don't see it. You can't touch it or taste it or smell it. A surgeon could operate on your brain and never find it. You might as well tear apart your radio during one of our broadcasts 
and try to find my voice inside. You'll find wires, condensers, resistors, tubes, transistors, potentiometers, dozens of other electronic gadgets, but not my voice. Yet my voice is real. God's spirit within is likewise real. God at this very moment stands watch both at the outpost of eternity and at the threshold of human thought. God loves each person as a son or daughter. We're brothers to each other in the family of God, if only we would dare to believe it. The Spirit of God in you is constantly coaxing you to become a better person, to follow divine guidance for your life by courageous, Spirit-inspired, life-changing decisions. But only you can make those decisions. If you noticed a brown-shelled acorn lying on the ground, you might at first mistake it for a stone. Yet an acorn, unlike a stone, has the living power of growth inside it. It is crucial to recognize you, too, have such a power of living spiritual growth within yourself. There resides in you, throbbing and vigorous and vibrant with life, the very spirit of the living God. And in seeking God, fail not to seek within. God is where you are. His child you are, if you would but have the faith to believe it. And since every child is entitled to know his father, and since God is the father of all humankind, you can literally know God in personal prayer, meditation, and worship. Where is God dwelling out somewhere beyond the beyond and over the yonder? What people need is a religion for this world, here, now, today. Such a religion is the teaching of Jesus, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man. Everybody's read the advice columns in daily newspapers where perplexed people write in for answers to their pressing problems and questions. Troubled souls send thousands of letters weekly to such journalistic oracles. Others seek out counselors, psychologists, ministers, bartenders, searching for advice, wisdom, insight into their difficulties. The more renowned the authority, the more people seek his advice. But think for a moment. Who would be the greatest authority in the world, even in the universe? God. But God doesn't write a column. It's better than that. God's spirit is within. You can receive insight and live a God-guided life by sincere prayer and communion. It is a totally transforming experience. God the Father loves and is with every person every moment here and now. And if you will muster the simple faith to believe that simple truth, you have found God. Amid the crumbling ruins of ancient temples, archaeologists sometimes find forgotten fragments of art, scattered gems, broken statuary beneath the stones and fallen pillars. Among the rubble of fallen human lives, there likewise lie fragments of forgotten beauty, remnants of toppled values, hopes, and buried meanings. Eternal yearnings live within the heart of man, and while they live, the soul shall never die. For finding God means having the faith to know that you have found God, to claim that by living faith, and then to live as the son or daughter of God you are. There waits and watches within you something eternal, something divine, the spirit of your Father. We are children of the everlasting one, sons of the living God. Believe that and really begin to live. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.